Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. And today we're going to be delving into the topic of monsters and vampires in particular. Well, actually, uh, the vampires would be the ones delving into us uh, <laughs> with, with their fangs. <laughs> and uh, I have had a particular interest in vampires that on a conscious level... Uh, was sparked by my daughter and granddaughter, who were, my daughter was reading Anne Rice, and my granddaughter, who was then a young teen, uh, was very, very interested in all the Twilight movies. And uh, I got curious about what on earth it was about vampires that was so interesting to them. And it was easy enough to go and see the the Twilight movies. And um, then I, I was bitten by these uh, figures who had their eternal life. A vampire will live forever unless specifically killed in in some specified ways, staked through the heart and various other things. Uh, And I was also wildly curious about what it was in popular culture that was making vampires all of a sudden, uh, it seemed as if they were everywhere. So I think about, uh, here it is, uh, vampires live on blood, and we all know that. That's the only thing they can have as sustenance. And the blood historically has been the life force. It's been a symbol for that. So they live forever, but they are also called the undead Uh, So it's a strange kind of life. And of course, the Ur-Vampire is our friend Dracula, who is a century and a quarter approximately old. Dracula, as the vampire, was created and brought into popular culture, although the myth goes into earlier times. But it's Bram Stoker and Dracula in 1897, uh, who really brought the vampire into popular culture. I have a question for you. Do you have any sense of, um, you know, the biography of Stoker? Do you know much about him? He was Irish, and he lived in England. And I believe that he, if memory serves, he was a theater director and quite, quite educated and that's really all I can... I mean, it, like, I find those. myself curious about his psychology, mm. you know? I mean, I, that is a great book. I love that book. And interestingly, in the original Dracula, there really is no character of Dracula. This is a novel that is composed of letters and communication by all the other characters in the novel. But you never hear from Dracula. And Dracula is off stage and we see what happens to we, his it's victims. It's almost like we see we see him reflected. We see him reflected. Right, he is a shadowy, are. shape-shifting creature, character that the other characters are in in quest of they are hunting him Mm -hmm. as he hunts his victims they hunt him Mm -hmm. so how do we um how do we make sense of this powerful imaginal figure uh, in terms of the personal psychology what do we do with that of in other words where is the inner vampire Mm-hmm. Uh, what does that represent? Well, what and why is it so fascinating to so many? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, I love vampires too. But I think oh, well, part of vampire? the loving of the vampires, yeah. I think, is the changing the the evolution of the image of the vampire. Absolutely. I think back when I was a kid, I had caught um, somehow they were showing clips of that first early vampire Nosferatu. movie, Nosferatu. Mm-hmm where the vampire was grotesque and terrifying and 
repugnant. It was frightening. Well, now we're evolved to these, you know, sexy, pristine, oh. godlike, oh, enviable, yeah. <laughs> yes. you know, vampire figures. That's an enormous shift in the And so what we're talking collective. about really is sort of the evolution of the archetype. Exactly. You're exactly right. If Nosferatu uh, and in Bram Stoker's Dracula, there is nothing attractive about this creature. They are hunting him. He is evil. And it's uh, very plain and one-sided, as we might say, as Jungians. As time has gone on with Bela Lugosi's Dracula, I think this movie was sometime in the 60s or early 70s, there is more of an erotic appeal of the stare and the victim has to capitulate to the vampire. You have to invite him in. You have to invite him in. Vampires cannot cross the threshold unless you open the window or open the door. So there is this dark attraction of in the victim for the vampire. Mm -hmm. Now today, or along around uh, the turn of the century into the 21st century, we have series like True Blood, uh, the Anne Rice novels, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and others where the vampires are much more humanized. They are in relationship with a human other. You know what I think is really interesting about that is that I, I also, I love the the movie Bram Stoker's Dracula that came out in the 90s by... Yes. Francis Ford Coppola. Okay, thank you. And I love that movie. And Gary Oldman is just so fabulous in that as, as Dracula. You know, I, I happen to know that that movie was the screenplay took many, many years in development. Hmm. And I really appreciate the screenplay of that movie because it's quite a faithful... It's quite faithful to the book, but it differs in one important way. They made one important change, and I and I felt that the change they made actually improved upon the book. That's a rare thing, and what they did was they humanized Dracula. Yes. By including this story in the beginning about his wife, Elisabetta, who throws herself off the castle when she thinks he's dead, and then he falls in love with Mina, not just out of some kind of, you know, it's in the book. Now I'm remembering in the book. We don't really know why he's going to London, except that he wants to maybe get fresh prey in the movie. They've added this additional motivation that he wants to see Mina. He wants to find Mina. And and isn't there a, a mystical nuance that uh, Mina is the reincarnation yes. or the return yes. of the old life? Right. Yes. Yes. That, that this is his Elisabetta who's been reincarnated. And the, the short story, I think with uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, that's mm -hmm. the full name of this movie, by the mm -hmm. way, uh, is that he was created as a vampire uh, through yes, yes. the trauma yes. that he suffered and his rejection of the church, which would not bury his dead wife. She committed suicide because she thought he was dead. Mm -hmm. So we have the origin of the vampire as trauma. That's right. And the other thing we have in that movie is, as you said, the humanization. It is the return of the feeling function. Mm -hmm. He sheds a tear and it trickles down his cheek. Whereas in previous vampire mm. myths, as far as I know, vampires lack feeling function. They have this addictive hunger mm -hmm. for blood, but not feeling. There's no feeling. And the subsequent vampire stories of, of Buffy and True Blood, just to cite two examples, the vampires in those also have feeling. They Full fall feeling. in love yeah. with Buffy and with... Um, uh, but Suki. Suki, the waitress. <laughs> so there's a relationship that really develops. So, so, and on that, this this way that sort of maybe life follows art is, and, and I, I hope I'm not going to get this wrong, but you know, in Buffy, the real bad vampire is is his name Spike. Angel. No, I'm thinking of the blonde haired one, Spike. Yes, Spike. Okay. So, uh, I think what happened is, you know, Spike was initially sort of the the real bad dude, and then he's a really fabulous actor, and he and Sarah Michelle Gellar, that's her name, right, who played Buffy. Mm -hmm had this chemistry. And so I think that the script, my sense is, and perhaps I also read this somewhere, that the story of Spike falling in love with Buffy sort of arose out of kind of organically 
the on-screen chemistry that these guys had and the way that the audience really kind of hooked in to Spike because of his kind of charisma and humanity as an actor. So it, it's this way that the script almost couldn't help but humanize Spike, the writing mm -hmm. of the show. Well, I'm thinking about Sookie and Bill and one of my favorite scenes where she reprimands him for killing an abusive uh, uncle of hers. And all that Bill, she says, you know, Bill, you, you just can't do this. You just can't go off and kill people. And all Bill can say in return is, he hurt you in a kind of wooden way. And finally she says, well, you know, I thought this relationship might be able to work despite our big differences. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't say anything. She says, Bill, please say something. And he's tongue tied and can't speak. So she starts to walk away and he quickly appears in front of her and declares his love for her. He says, in a hundred and some, sixty some years, I haven't felt anything. And now I feel something for you. And he says in this wooden way, I love you. <laughs> and it's, there, there is a wonderful uh, note here, repeated in a lot of vampire stories, of the return of the feeling function in the vampire of his struggling to find that in himself, struggling to find it in a relationship. And I think the story there is how healing human relationships are for all of us. Mm -hmm. We need a relationship with an other who will stick with us and grow us and bloom us into fuller humanity. I'm just wanting to kind of play around with this image because it seems to me like it's always a male vampire and a human female. And I wonder about, first of all, are, are we sort of imagining these vampires as kind of an anonymous figure and what would that say? Or are we, are, are we imagining that, you know, Sookie and Buffy are anima figures and, and what does that mean? Or do we feel that this tendency kind of reflects a kind of societal expectation that men will uh, not be in touch with their feelings and be sort of vampire-like. A little bit of classic stereotyping. Yeah, exactly. I think that that is there, and you're right. Today it is uh, the males, who, by the way, are always very attractive, compelling actors, <laughs> uh, that they do have a certain kind of sex appeal. And there is this kind of stereotypical typecasting, mm -hmm. that it, it's the woman who can g stick with them and help them learn to love. On the other hand, these women are feisty, strong, powerful women. Buffy is the vampire slayer, uh, and Suki is also a very strong woman. Should they insist on these male vampires meeting their standard for a relationship? I'm moving around this kind of archetypal pattern of this man that becomes so massively traumatized that it transforms him, it warps him into a parasitic creature who then visits this wound upon other people, turning them mm -hmm. into parasitic creatures and does this through a kind of hypnotic domination of other people. I'm sitting with that and trying to think about some of the other human applications that that might apply to in terms of perhaps intergenerational trauma, perhaps the way that a traumatized parent communicates coping mechanisms to the child so that we can see trauma behavior or trauma adaptations in children which is very confusing to them because they have no memory of actually being traumatized. It feels very deep and very mysterious in a certain way, kind of landing it. And I wonder if the focus or the fascination with vampires being represented in the culture is because there is a certain cultural spirit that wants us to become aware of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting idea, I think, in Jungian mm -hmm. thought 
that the culture has its own kind of independent spirit, has its own kind of intelligence. Well, or you could say sort of the collective unconscious is sort of mm. manifesting this as an image that needs to be attended to somehow. Are you talking about various ways in which we can become sort of half alive, hypnotized or somewhat not fully present for our lives? Because I think there there are so many ways that that happens in today's culture, from screen addiction and video game addiction and substance addiction <laughs> to the demands of a culture that wants us to perform and think and do and not feel and to go through life in a kind of automaton way. And I, I don't know about you, but people talk about that, of that, here's my work week, I have to get up at six, I go to work, I'm in a cubicle all day, then I come home, and then the next day I do it all over again. Of the all the ways in which we can be not fully alive and have the life force sort of leached out of us in the ways that vampires can do that, vampires don't necessarily just kill their mm -hmm. victims. When they're in relationship with a particular victim, they sort of sip a little bit of blood out of that person and weaken the mm -hmm. person. And sort of drain them of life. And drain them slowly of life force so the victim remains alive, uh, but not fully alive. I mean, a lot of people have jobs that do that. Jobs, life, and sometimes we do it to ourselves with mm -hmm. uh, lots of screen time, whatever that might mean. Substances, absolutely. We have a huge heroin epidemic going on. Mm -hmm. We could list a lot of ways in which we lack access to ourselves and our own life force. Well, uh, I feel like the conversation is landing in, in a lot of different important areas that the whole idea or the inquiry around what drains us mm -hmm. and perhaps might drain us against our will mm -hmm. and that we are actually kind of co-participating in, in a somewhat hypnotic way. Mm hmm so if we think about this kind of obsessive use of an iPhone uh, or gaming, perhaps, that we almost feel as if we're being willing participants or even happy participants yeah, and not even aware that we're anemic. And that's what I like about the mythology that the person has to invite them in. The vampire, the person has to invite the vampire in. Yes. That's, that's that idea that you right. were just talking about, about. We sort of, we capitulate, we give in to these things. And that hypnotic, uh, you've used the word hypnotic a couple of times, Joseph, of, that is actually part of the origin of the vampire, I believe, in, in Bram Stoker with the uh, neuroscientists uh, Jean-Martin Charcot and Pierre Janet in France with women who were today, we would di diagnose them, That I use that word in quotes, very differently, but they were very interested in hypnosis and altered states of consciousness. And it was very disturbing to the populace at the time. People were curious, fascinated, and alarmed because all of a sudden humanity was being seen very differently. There was a whole psychology here different from physiology, and that was very new toward the end of the 19th century of what we were capable of. And it was fascinating, which means there's something that draws our attention, that involves us, that leads us on, and something that's really in the unconscious, so we don't quite know what it is. And that's exactly what happens with a vampire, is there's something hypnotic, something fascinating and kind of unconscious where we go willingly into an altered state. Hmm. So, you know, what's really interesting, you know, it seems to me some of the vampire series are saying, first of all, there needs to be an enlivened relationship. And secondly, how valuable real consciousness, awakeness to ourselves and in our lives is because that that's really the thing that allows for transformation yes i'm sitting with as i'm listening this um wanting to land this a little bit more say in a, in a clinical setting or a, in a, a kind of human lived out way and i'm thinking the way vampires are often viewed as some kind of a hybrid between a human and an animal and that what's shocking about them is that you have 
a human being who is somehow suddenly behaving in an animalistic way. That this this man that's suddenly become a vampire is is behaving like a vampire bat, living off of this blood of another person. And that so much of human morality is about separating out between what is human and what is animal. And when animal behavior evidences in a human being the tremendous kind of distress that human culture has about it, mm. you know, if we see a, a lion take down a gazelle, and kill it and eat it, there's a way in which it might be distasteful, but it's expected. But if we see our neighbor do that out in the street, just kill somebody and eat them, uh, that's horrifying. Although human bodies are animal bodies, but we kind of have a different expectation about human beings and how they should behave. So this to me is also an image of a human being who is possessed by this archetype of predation that should be banished from human culture. And right now, uh, when I think about our culture in general, there is such an excitement around the capacity for human predation, the category of predation, hmm. that I can get from another person what I need without any sense of consequence to the other person, whether I am tricking them or hypnotizing them or bilking them of money. And even the current move in our government to take away any sense of limits or oversight so this idea of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, or let the average citizen beware, because anybody could be a vampire, and it's up to you to deal with how you're going to handle vampires. Everybody should be armed, because anyone could be a predator. So this idea of this infection of the predator, and how that's being spread, is a place that I'm kind of going to as I'm looking mm. at landing it. Well, and of course, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think that I'm the first person to think, I mean, I, I think if, if we try to think about vampires diagnostically, yeah. you know, you, you kind of think, oh, well, that's, you know, sociopathy, right? That's a that's a personality disorder there. Someone who, mm -hmm. who has no regard for right. the feelings of others and just is going to sort of get whatever they can. So I want to leave us on a somewhat optimistic note because <laughs> the current vampire tales are talking about the return of Eros, which is life force. It is love. It is a relationship between the vampire and the human. And the call to greater consciousness on the part of, of both of those in the relationship. And that's, I think, the antidote, uh, the new thing that the mm -hmm. culture is highlighting in these some of these films. dream do you have for us? Okay, well, we will move into that right now. This is the dream of a woman uh, who is in her 60s, and she says, this is a repeating dream. I am still at school, but have reached well into middle age. I am unwilling to stay there, unwilling to study or sit for any exams, as I have already qualified as a nurse. I wish to go and secure a job. So the first thing that I've noted is that it's a repeating dream, mm. which often indicates something that Psyche uh, really wants us to know. Uh, so message hasn't been received, so it gets re-delivered and re-delivered, really almost asking, please pay attention, please bring me into consciousness. Something important is going on, and I want your conscious attention. Yeah, I mean, when someone brings a repeating dream in, especially, you know, it's like, well, I had this last month, and here it is again. You know, there's a little bit of an assumption of, like, we didn't get it last time. We must not have fully understood it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be coming back again. And then the next thing that happens here is, I'm still at school, but have reached well into middle age, which seems to indicate, oh, well, why are you still at school? This seems uh, middle age and still in school don't go together. Middle age indicates a time of ripening uh, in one's life or career rather than still being at school. I noticed that the dream says, um, I'm in school, I'm supposed to be studying, and yet I've already qualified. So yes. there's some kind of uh, internal contradiction in the dream where she both needs to study and take exams, and yet she's already done that. Or at yeah. least the dream ego feels that she's qualified. Yes. Yeah. So if we remember that the 
waking mind of the dreamer is always, or almost always, being challenged to reconceive itself mm. by some deeper wisdom in the unconscious. So we have the ego being sure she's certified as a nurse, but the unconscious keeping her in school, demanding that she take exams, and that she keep learning even though she's middle-aged or the dreamer herself is in her yeah. 60s. There is an idea, particularly in Jung's work, which was novel at the time, is that human development doesn't stop at adulthood. Because prior to that, there was an idea in, in the Freudian work that we went through developmental stages that kind of stopped. Actually, by age five, yeah. Freud yeah. said, you were sort of done. We're done. But so, Jung felt people were in school their mm -hmm. whole lives in a manner of speaking. Yeah. So there's a, a, a tension here between you're in school because maybe there's something you still need to learn in life and the dream ego, the more conscious position, which is I've already qualified, now I need a job. I'm also playing with this idea of caretaking because in the dream it says I've already qualified as a nurse. Mm, and mm -hmm. that there's a caregiving quality, obviously, to nursing, and there's a caregiving quality to being in school. Mm. Uh, we call colleges our alma mater, our, our mother, a kind of mothering place. And so I'm wondering if maybe what needs to be learned, as I'm really stretching into this, is something that's not related to receiving and giving care. Hmm. That's really interesting. So that if the dreamer were here, we might ask them if they had any sense of what were the subject matters that were being taught I'm, in this inner school. I'm also noticing in a really interesting way that there's sort of a parallel between the situation in the dream and what is true about the dream and the dreamer's life. In other words, if the dream is school, the dream keeps coming back. You know, it's like she's still in school. She still has to learn something. The dream keeps on coming back, said, no, you're still here. So just, just like there's a repeated demand in the dream for her to study and qualify, even though she supposedly doesn't need to do that anymore, the dream keeps on presenting a demand that she learned something from the dream. The dream itself could be the educational mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. It does seem like on both levels, the, the unconscious is communicating that there's more to be learned. And uh, that ambiguity is there with, I wish to go and secure a job. That on one level, it's, uh, I've qualified as a nurse, so I want a job out there that will pay me. But one might ask, what is the new inner job that you need to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the interesting wording here of to secure a job, uh, what needs to be more secure inside? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially in the 60s, of what is a life task we might imagine? What kind of life task? development, inner development, does one do at age 60 or early 60s? Clearly, it's not a job out there necessarily in the external world. You're way past the stage of building a career. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does that mean to you now? Yeah, those would be important questions. I think those are questions that the dream is asking. Yes. And that the ego is uncomfortable with, but are essential. Yeah, well, the dreamer, I think, said about this, you know, we ask sort of what are the feelings in the dream? And I think I think the wording was that I'm wasting my time. Oh. Mm -hmm. So life wants more from her. I think. Yes, and it's a crisis of meaning. Whenever we feel like we're wasting our time, we're participating in something, but either we don't know what it means or the meaning it used to have has lost all of its steam has lost its value. Mm -hmm. So this search for meaning. And of course, that begs the question of where does meaning come from? And I think particularly in the second half of life, we're much more resistant to having the culture tell us what something means, but that the soul itself has to reveal and invest in the circumstance and declare a meaning. And because it comes from the center point, it has more sustaining value. Absolutely. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, from our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.